what I met him many times in, 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 in Brazil. So thank you, Paul, for being uh, my, somehow my neighbor. Thank you very much. As it turned out, uh, for many years, I have not to think, I have not thought about uh, foliations, leaves, and all these things, which have been uh, my main motivation during the beginning of my career. And so I said to myself, maybe I should try to find something. I should tell them, uh, maybe not a new theorem, but maybe an open question I have not solved in for many years. So be patient. The question will be my last slide. So I will try to motivate it uh, slowly. Uh, and I want to begin by uh, something which is very, very old and very important for all of us, which is the concept of Riemann surface. As you know, Riemann in 80s, 1857 had this very great insight and very simple idea that if you want to study a polynomial equation like f of x, y is equal to zero, where f is a polynomial in two complex variables, x and y, you can think of this as being a function y as a function of x, except that the main problem is that given an x, you have a finite number of solutions for the equation f of x, y is equal to zero. So y is not quite a function, is a multi-value function. And Riemann had this great idea to make this multi-value function single valued by this simple trick, which is that you consider the set of couples uh, x, y, such that f of x, y is equal to zero. So this is a one-dimensional complex curve in C2. And if you compactify it, adding suitable points at infinity, and if you desingularize it, which Riemann did not quite know how to do it, but he did it anyway, you get a compact Riemann surface on which the function y is single valued. This is like a very crazy and simple idea. You have this function f of x, y is equal to zero, and y is now a single valued function, which is defined on a Riemann surface, which is a smooth, compact, one dimensional over the complex uh, uh, Riemann curve. So this picture is, when I see this picture, I say, well, how could it be so simple? But that was a great idea of Riemann in 1857. So uh, before I go on, let me show you something that I discovered last month in the archives of the Académie des Sciences. Uh, yeah, one of the good points of being in the Académie des Sciences is that uh, uh, 20 meters from me, there is a huge quantity of boxes full of papers which have not been read for centuries. And uh, I had the idea recently to look at uh, the box with the name Victor Puiseux on it. Uh, most of you know the Newton Puiseux series, uh, uh, enabling, enabling us to desingularize Riemann surfaces. But the paper of Puiseux was written in 1850. So therefore it was before the paper of Riemann. Etienne, maybe there's a trouble. Maybe you had changed the slide, but we still see the first one, you know? Ah, so I don't know what I should do. Maybe so, as we did the other day, you should send the file and somebody will present for you. Let me, yeah. let me try. No, or no, maybe, start it up. Or, or, or maybe you could it again. start again. I start again. What do you see now? See, all your stop letters sharing, to stop the individuals. <coughs> maybe let to stop sharing and to open once again. Nouveau partage. Nouveau partage. Uh, see. This uh, is like looking at Trump's records in Mar-a-Lago. And then do share screen on that. But you have to do share screen in Zoom. 
Uh, did I need that? No, no, okay, okay. You, we can see the file. You will see the file? Change the page then. Let's see what happens. And we don't see the need change. Uh, did, did you pick the file when you did share screen or desktop? So what do you see now? Page the, two or page one? The page page one. one. So I don't know what to do. Do, do share screen? Yes, I did that. But yes, then pick, when you pick the icon, what, which icon did you pick? You should be desktop one or two, not I, the file. It's written you are sharing your screen. You, you are sharing this one page. You should share your desktop. Okay, let me try again. So you should stop share and start all over. Oh. Let me stop this one. I share no, this, this one. You don't have to stop. You have to stop share screen. You have to open your uh, talk. So I open my file. Do stop share screen and do share screens from scratch. Okay. I'm 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 just guessing. I, I really don't know. <laughs> so I share. I share the desktop. Share the desktop, yeah. A dangerous move, dangerous. Okay. Now do full screen with your talk. It now it changed. It's fine, it's fine. Okay, great. It's okay? It's okay. okay. Great. Bravo. Bravo. Okay, so, uh, uh, I, I, okay, so that was the picture showing that the multi-valued function Y becomes single-valued on the Riemann surface. And then I said that uh, I was lucky to open the box Victor Puiseux. Uh, Victor Puiseux wrote his famous paper on singularities of algebraic curves in 1850, therefore uh, seven years before Riemann. And I discovered this draft from Victor Puiseux showing that uh, uh, Puiseux read Riemann, of, of course, after, after the publication of Riemann, and uh, it's amazing to see that he drew pictures, like uh, you can see here, several pictures, trying to understand how topology could uh, 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 enable you to understand better the singularities of algebraic functions. And uh, it's amazing because a few years later, in 1881 or 1882, uh, when Poincaré began uh, his study on Fuchsian groups, there is this famous uh, exchanges of letters between Poincaré and uh, Felix Klein. And Poincaré claims that he never heard about Riemann, which is a very, very surprising since Poincaré was uh, uh, very aware of the existence of Puiseux and Puiseux was aware of the existence of Riemann. Anyway, uh, these, uh, these pictures and these documents uh, should be studied uh, in, in a deeper way because it's, in the, it's very interesting to understand the, the relationship between the German and the French at the time. Okay, so let me go on now. Uh, the question that uh, uh, you can ask is the following. That instead of having one algebraic fun function, y of x, suppose you have two algebraic functions, y one of x, and y2 of x. So the first one is defined by a polynomial equation f1 of x, y1 is equal to zero. And the second one is f2 of x, y2 is equal to zero. Uh, I told you it's very easy to make each of them single valued on Riemann surface. And the question which is very natural in the spirit of Riemann is, can you make both of them single valued on the same Riemann surface. It's fundamental. You have two algebraic functions. You want to add them uh, or multiply them or do something with them. And it would be very useful to have them defined si uh, simultaneously on the same Riemann surface. This is a question which is obvious and uh, Riemann uh, answered it immediately. And the, the solution is, is the following. So you have two, two algebraic functions. Each one is single valued on a different Riemann surface, and you want to build one Riemann surface. And the, the trick is very simple. You 
you define sigma f1, f2 as being the set of track rules, x, y1, y2, such that the two equations f1 of x, y1 is equal to zero and f2 is equal to zero. And on this, this defines also a Riemann surface in C3 now, you compactify it, you, you desingularize it, and on this, uh, uh, this uh, single Riemann surface, uh, Y1 and Y2 are single value because they are just projections of, uh, of, the, of both of them. This surface, sigma F1, F2, is a branch cover of sigma 1 as well as sigma 2. And now you come to the natural question, do you need branch cover? Or do you, could you use non-branch cover? And this is a, a question, given two compact hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, sigma one and sigma two, does there exist a compact Riemann surface which is holomorphically unbranched over sigma one and sigma two and which would transform the two uh, functions y1 and y2 in a single value from a single unbranched problem. This is a question which is uh, easy to solve. I will answer it immediately. And uh, also, uh, Riemann knew that, of course. And the answer of Riemann is, uh, is no. Uh, uh, you can see more or less using modern terminology and using uh, uh, um, Fuchsian groups that we are now used to use. You have on this picture two Fuchsian groups. Well, they don't look the same. You can think of them as being two Riemann surfaces, the quotient of the disk by these two Riemann, by these, these two Fuchsian groups. And you can ask, uh, is there a common unbranched cover of these two surfaces, which is basically the same question as is there a subtiling of these two tilings which is common to the two? And it is quite clear that the answer is no. And the, the answer of, of, of Riemann is very simple. Just count. Riemann knew, and this is one of the main contributions of Riemann, that if you take the set or the space of Riemann surfaces on a given topological surface of genus G, Riemann showed that uh, they depend on the 3G minus 3 moduli. So the moduli space is a finite dimensional complex manifold of dimension 3G minus 3 and hence is uncountable. So this is more or less what Riemann knew and showed. However, if you pick a given Riemann surface, but it has a countable number of finite coverings. Therefore, there is no hope that you can find given two Riemann surfaces uh, common uh, uh, unbranched cover for the both of them. So the answer is no, there is no hope. And indeed, if you, look, if you read Riemann, you see that he says that explicitly. Okay, so this is very easy. Now comes the difficult question. Uh, the difficult question, is uh, uh, bef before I, gi I, I, I give the difficult question, let me explain the easy question. Let's forget about complex structure and uh, let's try to look at the topological question. Suppose you have two compact orientable surfaces of genus at least two and forget about complex structure and just think about uh, smooth surfaces and look for uh, compact surface, which would be a cover, an unbranched covering or of both of them. And then the question is easy and the answer is yes, of course, because we know exactly how to classify surfaces, topological surfaces. And uh, as you know, they are just characterized by the Euler characteristics, which is two by two, two minus two G. And you also know that when you go to a finite cover, the Euler characteristics is multiplied by the degree of the covering. Therefore, if you give me two Riemann surfaces, and if you look for a common topological cover, which is common, well, the only 
thing to do is to find a, a number which is a common multiple of the two uh, of the two Euler characteristics, and this is very easy given two numbers to find another one which is a common multiple. So the, the topological question is trivial. The complex structure is not only non-trivial but it's false. I mean, there is no there is no common holomorphic. Uh, 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 cover for two Riemann surfaces. And now come the tricky question. Can you, not yet, I'm sorry, my, my file is going too, too, too slowly. Uh, the, the universal cover of hyperbolic surfaces, as we know, is biholomorphic to the unit disk by Poincaré uniformization. Now we know that. And you can ask similar questions for more objects. Suppose you have two compact objects, which could be topological or metrical. Do they have isomorphic finite covers? Well, we have seen that the answer is no for Riemann surfaces with complex structures. We have seen that the answer is yes for, for topological surfaces. And here's another example where the answer is yes in a somehow non-trivial way. This is the theorem that I like very much, the theorem of Leighton, saying that if you take two finite graphs, and if you assume that they have the same universal cover, or I mean, of course, the universal cover of the finite graph is a tree, but if you assume that these trees are isomorphic, then these two finite graphs have a common finite cover. And this is um, not very hard theorem, but this is an interesting and kind of tricky theorem. In particular, if you take two finite graphs, which are both K regular, meaning the valency of each vertex is K, then they do have a common finite cover. Uh, I think it's already something interesting. Let's say, uh, Look at pictures. All these finite graphs have valency three. So if you take the universal cover, it has to be the the binary tree where each vertex has a, 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 a have valency three. So all these finite graphs have this as a cover as has a as a universal cover, and it follows from the theorem of Leighton that any two of these finite graphs have a finite isomorphic finite covers. And this is a, a good exercise for you. And I think it's interesting theory. So let's come back to the question of, uh, of uh, isomorphic or non-isomorphic human surfaces over the complex. And now we come to the question which is called the even price conjecture. Let me tell you, this conjecture has been formulated by uh, Aaron Price in 1970, quite explicitly. And uh, I remember a conversation with Gromov, where Gromov uh, told me that according to him, this question was due to, to him and himself. Well, he told me, have a look at the, look at the, look at the the original paper of, of Vriman, you will see that he mentions the fact that by cardinality as condition that the moduli space is uncountable and the set of covering of, the, of, of coverings of a given Riemann surface is countable, it's impossible to hope to have exactly uh, uh, common uh, covers. But if you look carefully in the paper of, of Riemann, you will see that actually is asking the question that we call Ehren Price conjecture. I looked in the paper of, uh, of, of Riemann. I read it carefully, but probably I'm not uh, imaginative enough as Gromov to find what he claims. Uh, but in a way, uh, this is the conjecture of, uh, Ehren, of uh, Ehren Price, which I believe is interesting. And uh, let, um, let me ask it uh, uh, precisely. You start with two compact hyperbolic surfaces, and now instead of thinking of them as being uh, uh, complex curves, 
you think of them as being uh, equipped with the Riemannian metric of curvature minus one. And now you try to find finite covers, which are not quite the same, but which are almost the same. So you fix an epsilon and you look for a compact hyperbolic surface, sigma, and unbranched coverings, pi one and pi two, from sigma to sigma one, and from sigma to uh, sigma two, which are not isometry, which are not a local isometries, because that would be impossible by this Riemann contability argument, but which are almost isometric up to an error epsilon. So you want that the norm of the derivative uh, uh, d of pi i of v should be between one plus epsilon times the norm of v and one minus epsilon times, times the norm of v. So you look for uh, uh, coverings which are unbranched, which are not local isometries, but which are as close as possible from an isometry. And for every epsilon, you look for something like that. This is the Aaron Price conjecture. This conjecture is hard. And as it turned out, it was proved uh, 10 years ago by Jeremy Kahn and Vladimir Markovich. This uh, uh, is a wonderful paper, very complicated paper, which is very, uh, very fascinating. And which is a full solution of the Aaron Price conjecture or maybe, uh, maybe Riemann's conjecture, I don't know. This is a, a very fascinating question. I want to formulate today a set of questions which are in the, in the same spirit and which are associated to foliation. So let me, before I do that, I want to reformulate the Ellen Price conjecture in a foliation terminology. So here's my, my, my new formulation, but before I do, I want to give you simple examples. Very, very simple examples. Here's an example, a toy model. Suppose you have two flat tori, Rn divided by a, by, by a co-compact lattice, lambda one, and Rn divided by a co-compact lattice, lambda two. And both of them are now equipped with their flat matrix. You give an epsilon and you ask the same question. Can you find a flat torus, Rn modulo from lattice with non-branch coverings on T1 and T2, whose differentials are isometric with an error of epsilon? So it's the same question as alien price except that instead of having cytabolic surfaces with curvature minus one, we have now tori with flat metric. And the answer is yes. And uh, you will see that this is not difficult at all. So let's have a look at the proof of this uh, uh, positive statement, which is not a theorem. It's very, very, very simple. Let me begin by the first simple case. The torus has dimension one, so it's a circle. So the first circle is uh, R modulo lattice A1Z. And the second uh, 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 circle is R modulo second lattice A2Z. And you, like, you, you look for a common, uh, a common uh, 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 covering, which is almost an isometry. And uh, the trick is very simple. You choose an integer N1, and you look at the map X, from the torus R modulo N1A1Z to the same X in R modulo A1Z. Of course, it's a local isometry, just uh, unrolling the circle N1 times. And then you look at the map X belonging to R modulo N1A1Z to R modulo A2Z, and then you put the coefficients in front of x, which is n2a2 divided by n1a1x. This is a linear map in one dimension. And uh, this map is also a finite covering. 
and it multiplies the metric by n two a two divided by n one a one. And if you want to find something which is as isometric as you want, well, it suffices to choose two integers, n1 and n2, such that n2 and a2 divided by n1, a1 is as close as you want from one. And this is very simple due to the fact that rational numbers are dense in the real line. So for circles, the this is completely obvious. Now let's go for uh, the n-dimensional case which is not more complicated, but, but that will be a, a, a way for me to introduce what I want to, uh, to introduce foliation in this discussion. So you have two tori, Rn modulo lambda one and Rn modulo lambda two. And uh, you look for something which is a covering of both and which is as isometric as possible. Well, you start by the two n-dimensional torus, which is the product of the two. And on this two n-dimensional torus, you look at the diagonal action of Rn, where the element T in Rn acts by translation on the two n-dimensional torus by the vector T, T. So it's a diagonal action of Rn on the two n-dimensional torus. So you have a foliation given by the orbits. The foliation has dimension n in this two n-dimensional uh, space. And the projection of each orbit or each factor t1 or t2 is simply a contraction of the length by a constant factor square root of two because it's a uh, 45 degrees in Pythagoras theorem. So you have this, uh, two n-dimensional torus foliated by the n-dimensional leaves. Projection of each factor is, uh, on each factor is, uh, uh, has a constant dilation. And what you do now is you have a linear action on the torus, you just approximate it by a rational one to make it, to construct a new, lin a new linear action of, of our n on these two n-dimensional torus which is such that all the orbits are closed. This is very easy. You just choose rational frequency. So this n-dimensional linear action of Rn can be approximated by a rational action of Rn on the two n-dimensional torus. And each compact orbit, when you project it on T1 or on T2, is equipped with a flat metric. And the flat metric is just almost multiplied by square root of two because the uh, original action had this uh, square root of two dilation. So if you divide the metric by a square root of two, you get the Aaron Price conjecture in the baby, baby version. So you see that in this simple and naive example, I could rephrase, rephrase the, the uh, Aaron Price question in terms of approximating a foliation by another foliation, which has the property that all orbits are closed. So let's try to rephrase the original question of, uh, of Aaron Price in this terminology. And in, in, in order to do that, I give a definition. Uh, a definition is the following. You have a compact manifold of dimension p, of dimension uh, p plus q. And in this manifold, you have a p-dimensional foliation. Let me give this following definition. I will say that the foliation of a pseudo-compact leaf, if for every epsilon, there is a submanifold, a compact submanifold, embedded submanifold of dimension p, the same dimension as the dimension of the leaves, which is not a leaf, but which angle with tangent plane makes an angle less than epsilon with the leaves at every point. So I approximate the foliation by a compact manifold, which is not quite, uh, which is not quite a, a, a leaf, but it is up to epsilon is a leaf. So that's definition. Uh, this is the, the key definition for today. Okay, so let me rephrase 
the conjectural event price in terms of this uh, pseudo compact leaf concept. Well, uh, we have seen some examples. Uh, if you take a linear foliation on Rn modulo uh, lattice, I just say that any linear foliation always has a pseudo compact leaf. Of course, it's enough to approximate the foliation itself by another foliation, linear foliation, which is such that all the leaves are, are, are closed. So if you approximate the foliation by, by another one for which all leaves are closed, you are done. So this is very easy. Another example is, is this, if you take a one dimensional foliation on any compact manifold, of course it always has a, a pseudo compact leaf because you can take a recurrent point and the recurrent point is not quite a, a closed leaf, but you can, in a flow box, flow to the original point, you just slightly change the direction of, of the flow to make it closed. This, uh, this comment is much, much more elementary than the closing lemma for vector field. Any recurrent point gives, uh, gives a, a pseudo compact leaf. So we have an example of linear actions. We, we, have, we have the example of, of uh, one dimensional foliation. They all have pseudo compact leaves. Now let's go to this uh, question and uh, I will make it more precise later on. Can one understand which foliation have these kind of pseudo compact leaves? Can we find necessary and sufficient condition for a foliation to have such a pseudo compact? I have no complete answer, but I will provide some more precise questions in a moment. So let me rephrase the question of Evan Price in this, using this uh, vocabulary of pseudo compact. You have two co compact lattices in PSL2R, so two hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, and you take the product six dimensional surface, PSL2R cross PSL2R, modulo the product of these two lattices. Of course, this six dimensional foliation, this six dimensional manifold, is equipped with a three-dimensional foliation, which is given by the, as before, by the diagonal action of PSL2R on PSL2R cross PSL2R. The element G goes to GG in PSL2 cross PSL2. So you have this six-dimensional manifold, and in this six-dimensional manifold, you have a six-dimensional, a three-dimensional foliation given by the orbits of this diagonal action. And the restatement, which is, uh, we, you will see it's very easy. The restatement is this. The Aaron Price conjecture is exactly the same thing as claiming that this three-dimensional foliation in this six-dimensional manifold has a pseudo compact leaf. So let me tell you, explain to you why, why this is the case. I'm not claiming at all that I'm providing another proof of the Price conjecture. I'm just rephrasing it in such a way that I can propose uh, a further open questions that might be interesting. So let me explain why this equivalence between even price conjecture and this uh, pseudo compact leaf for this uh, specific foliation. That's uh, rather easy. Uh, suppose, first of all, that the two uh, Riemann surfaces, uh, disk modulo gamma one and disk modulo gamma two, have a common unbranched cover, which is holomorphic. Well, this is equivalent to saying that these two lattices, gamma one and gamma two, have a common finite index subgroup up to conjugacy. Now, if you have see such a situation, a common finite cover, well, this pro provides a compact leaf for the three-dimensional foliation. You have a canonical compact leaf, PSL to R modulo gamma. Gamma is the common finite index subgroup of gamma one and gamma two, which embeds as a compact three-dimensional manifold in PSL2R cross PSL2R modulo gamma one cross gamma two. So 
the existence of a common finite cover for D model gamma one and D model gamma two is a basically equivalent to the existence of a compact leaf for this three dimensional foliation. Now, if you have an, an almost compact uh, uh, leaf, if you have a if you have a coverings from D2 modulo gamma uh, to D2 modulo gamma one gamma two, which are not isometric, but which are isometric up to epsilon, it is not difficult to show that the existence of this epsilon covering implies the existence of an epsilon pseudo compact leaf for the foliation. And more, and the converse is true. It's not difficult. I will not do it here because it's useless. Because after all, we know that Ellen Price conjecture is true. That would be uh, uh, useless to 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 go to go on. But uh, you can do the exercise to indeed show that any pseudo compact leaf for this foliation is basically the same as an epsilon cover, which is common for the two surfaces. So this is a restatement of the price conjecture, which might be uh, uh, interesting and which might open new questions uh, uh, as I, I will show you soon. First, I give a necessary condition. That's not difficult. If you have a foliation with a pseudo compact leaf, it has to have at least a non-trivial transversally invariant measure. Let me prove it in a very simple case. Suppose you have a finite group G generated by a finite set S. Suppose this group acts in a compact detrizable space X. And let me define an epsilon orbit or something like that. I say that one says that the action has a pseudo finite orbit. If for every epsilon, we can find a finite set F in X. And a homomorphism from G to the group of bijections of this, not X, sorry, uh, from the group of bijections of F, not X, of finite bijection, such that this uh, homomorphism pi approximates the original action in the sense that for every X in F and every G in the generalism set S, the distance between pi of G of X and G of X is less than epsilon. This is, is the analogous to the to the pseudo orbit to pseudo compact leaf for foliation it's a pseudo uh, finite orbit for a group action if you have such a picture well you can take the uniform probability uh, dirac masses on f you take a limit of the weak limit when of these probabilities when epsilon goes to zero and every limit is an invariant action for the a different measure for the group action. So any group acting with a pseudo finite orbit must have an invariant measure. This is very easy. And if you want to generalize that for the foliation case, this is also an exercise for you. If you have a pseudo or pseudo compact orbit, you must have a transversely invariant measure. But that, so, looks, a lot, what? that looks a lot like the Sophic condition for groups. Yes, it looks like that, indeed. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, they may not have quite, to... not quite, but it looks like. Now, note that this forces the group G to have at least one, at least a few subgroups of finite index. Otherwise, you're lost. This is a very simple observation. Okay, now let's go to co-dimensional one foliation. And for co-dimensional one foliation, I just remark that the existence of a transverse invariant measure in this particular case of co-dimension one is necessary and sufficient to have a pseudo compact leaf. And the proof is, uh, is using all theorems of Saxted and Planck that most of you know, as you know, that if you have a foliation, co-dimension one foliation with a, a, a transversely invariant measure, this measure might be a, a, a compact leaf in this case, we're happy, or it could be topologically conjugate to a foliation defined by a closed form. And you take this closed form, you approximate it by a closed form with rational periods, 
and the foliation therefore is approximated by another one uh, for which all leaves are closed. So if you put this together, this is all my youth, huh, this uh, transverse invariant measures. So for co-dimensional one foliation, pseudo-compact leaf and existence of a transverse invariant measure is just the same thing. However, if you go to a higher co-dimension, this is not true. For example, if you take a finitely presented uh, simple group, and if you uh, uh, let it act on a space uh, with an invariant measure, well, you're lost. This, uh, this, this simple group has no finite index subgroup, and therefore it does not have a pseudo finite orbit, and so the corresponding foliation does not have a pseudo uh, a compact leaf. So uh, uh, you see that the existence of compact of transversely, transversely invariant measure and the existence of pseudo compact leaves are not equivalent. Now let me go to uh, uh, the, the, my my question. I promised an open question toward toward the end of my of my talk, and this is what it is. I want to generalize the Aaron Price conjecture and uh, 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 present for you an open question. It's a very natural question in the spirit of what I said today. You take a connected Lie group, G. You take a connected unimodular Lie subgroup, H. You take a co-compact lattice, gamma in G. And you look at the action of H on G mod gamma just by left translation. Why did I choose unimodular? I chose H to be unimodular in such a way that the left action on G mod gamma will preserve by more or less by definition of unimodular, will preserve the harm measure on the connected Lie group G. Therefore, if you take such wide families of examples of foliations, all of them have a transverse invariant measure. And a good example would be G is SL2 cross SL2, and H could be the diagonal SL2 in SL2 cross SL2, and we are back to the Erin Price conjecture. And so this is a more general setting in which we can ask the question of Erin Price. And the question of Erin Price is this Does this foliation on G mod gamma defined by left translations, does it have an almost compact leaf? And this is the question I wanted to offer you. <laughs> I hope somebody will solve it. Uh, yeah, my talk is finished. I just want to. Uh, uh, I was happy to listen to Paul. I mentioned that to him a few minutes before my talk. I was happy to listen to talk the other day uh, via via YouTube. And I also I was also happy to uh, to see that he mentioned the fact that his, uh, his faith in God. Myself, my faith in God has disappeared long time ago. But I, I know that uh, being close to Paul has always been uh, 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 questioning me. And when he mentioned uh, yesterday or before yesterday, uh, this theory that I hate completely, <laughs> that uh, I, I would be, uh, how did he say, uh, uh, anonymous Christian, uh, I, I am totally in, against this idea, Paul. So thank you very much, Paul, for everything, but not for this idea. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all. So is there any question in the audience, maybe first? No, Paul? No question. Okay, well, I have a question. I still continue the question. Um, if you have a sophic group of which many people talk all the time, mm -hmm. one type of sophic group has approximations by finite quotients. So uh, anything that's residually finite is sophic. Mm -hmm. Could that be used to address your problem at the end? I, I have some doubts because after all, you, the concept of sophic group concerns the group, does not concern the action of the group. Yeah. So, so you, 
you might be right that Sophie Goose might answer my question positively, but that maybe not an if and only if. So you could call these Sophic actions some. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it would fit into the framework. It sounds, it, yeah, it sounds promising problem. Sounds like something somebody could do. No more question? Or oh, maybe I just have one, just a naive one. It's just, uh, uh, do you really don't know any counter example to the last question? For any day, any no, no, if I knew one, I would have said, I would have said so. <laughs> no, no, I don't know any counter example. Do you know one? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so one one maybe one easy step would be to look at the case where G is nilpotent, which might be a bit more complicated than the abelian group that I mentioned earlier. Oh no, I, I was just going to ask in the could I mention one case? why the existence of, of a transverse invariant measure is uh, necessary. But uh, uh, while taking the, a few seconds, I think that I see the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Etienne. No, this is an easy question. I, uh, easy question, maybe the solution is complicated. I don't know. Okay. So I wanted to make a comment on ATN's comment about <coughs> my citing of uh, the theologian Karl Rahner about anonymous Christians. And of course, <laughs> of course, it is obvious that someone who is an atheist or agnostic doesn't agree to be an anonymous Christian. But I also explained that I was respecting the opinions yes. of other people, and I think that it's really important for a person to follow his own inspiration, his own uh, way of looking at things honestly, and not to uh, not course. to pretend. So what I'm saying, what I was saying is, for a Christian who believes that there's a Creator who created everyone and loves everyone equally. It's not so important that a person be an atheist or an agnostic, but God loves that person equally. And uh, I think that, uh, in that from a Christian perspective, uh, the Holy Spirit is guiding and helping people to live reasonable and good lives. So it's not that you're supposed to believe that you're an anonymous Christian, but <laughs> it is that someone who is a Christian in his position would see it that way. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, when, when, when you mentioned that, I looked in Google, anonymous Christian, and I read uh, the commentaries about that. And what I read was a bit different from what you said. Uh -huh. uh, uh, what I read is that uh, people who have not been in contact with the Christian religion are anonymous Christians. But myself, having been in full contact for a good part of my life with the uh, with the religion, I am not anonymous Christian because of that. Well, but that uh, 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 Etienne, that's in you found that on Google, but the person <laughs> who introduced that term was Karl Rahner, uh, a German Jesuit theologian, in the last century, and his definition was not the one you found on Google. So uh, it's independent of whether one has never heard of Jesus Christ or whether one has uh, even perhaps been a believing Christian and then no longer. Uh, okay, anyway, thank you for I, anyway, I, 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 just, I just wanted to, uh, to clarify that I want to respect everyone in their, his or her position, oh. and uh, oh, I'm this. not trying to force you <laughs> to become oh. anonymous Christians. But thank no, you no, for I bringing didn't. that up, Etienne. And thank you very much for the marvelous talk. Now sure. we can work oh, on that question. Your, your comment is very clear, and I, I'm not uh, against that. I just wanted to say that your faith has always been, has always been challenging me. 
So thank you for that. Okay. If I dare, maybe we should uh, invent the term of uh, pseudo-anonymous Christian, maybe, after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Two points for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Au revoir.